Good morning, everyone. So we are about to start this, uh, the second week here of the school. Uh, we have uh, a few slight changes to, to the program uh, because, you know, sometimes uh, travel doesn't go quite as planned. Uh, and Carlos Arguelles, he he's uh, arriving probably now at the, at the hotel, so uh, we're giving him a bit extra time and let's see if he's feeling uh, okay to give the lecture in the afternoon. Otherwise, we can move uh, one of the other short lectures uh, to the afternoon and put him the next day for two lectures, poor guy. Um, and uh, also, so we'll start with Edivaldo here at 11.30 to one. And uh, since this is a, such a nice day and Avelina Paulista is such a nice, has such a nice vibe today, we, uh, we thought it was nice to give you two hours for lunch so you can go and have an easy lunch and walk around Avenida Paulista, which is super nice today. So instead of having one and a half hours for lunch, we have two hours. So we should be back here by three. Okay, and then at three, presumably, we then start with Carlos, then we have coffee at 4.30 to, to five, and then five until last customer, we have your presentations here. Okay, and the other days, uh, the, the times will, be, uh, will go back to normal. So I just changed those times here in the left column just so that, that those are just for today. The other days of the week, we'll have uh, uh, the regular times of the first week. Okay. Um, let's see, that's all that I need to say. I hope everybody had fun on Friday. And, uh, and by the way, you don't have to wait until the end of lectures to ask questions, okay? You can just, uh, I'm always, uh, the chairs are always looking at you and you can just raise your hands or you can just shout out and ask questions at any time. You don't have to wait till the last minute. Um, otherwise, probably the speakers will just think that they can speak for the whole duration of their, of their talks, which is, you know, uh, so interrupt us at any time to ask questions. Feel free to do that, okay? We can just run to you and give you the microphone. All right, so Edivaldo, it's uh, with you. Okay, so um, good morning, everybody. So I also hope you had um, fun uh, in series on Friday, and it's nice to see that we have audience in a um, Sunday morning here. Um, okay, so, so the title of my talk is uh, Age and Population Studies um, with Gamma Rays. So the idea is to uh, discuss a little bit how um, um, a uniform survey of the sky can bring you information on, on aging properties uh, like uh, how these uh, guys, how these uh, objects are uh, distributed in, in redshift and luminosity, and how if you have um, some some good measurements of the uh, spectral energy distribution of, of AGNs, um, how you can do, for example, cosmology and, and some astrophysics. Okay, uh, so this is a, an overview of what I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, I'm going to start saying a few words about the differences between an AGN and, an, and a normal galaxy. Um, some of you might be familiar with these differences, but I hope. I, I think um, some other uh, people may not be familiar with that. And then I'll spend some time um, um, showing some um, blazer emission at the GV energy scale and what is the status of what we call the uh, gamma ray luminosity function. So this is basically, you can, you can see that as a probability distribution. Um, uh, more precisely, the probability, the PDF, to find a certain AGN and a, at a certain redshift with a certain luminosity and even some uh, spectral uh, feature like the photon index. Then uh, we move to the TV energy scale and see how the sky uh, looks like at the TV energy scale, at least uh, as, as far as um, AGN emission is, is concerned. Um, and then um, I'll spend some time uh, talking a little, bit, a little bit about these absorption effects in the GV and TV energy scale because the universe is not transparent, uh, it's not completely transparent uh, to uh, GV or TV photons. There's some opacity in the extragalactic medium and you cannot just neglect that, that opacity if you want to do any uh, blazer spectral study. And then we move at, to the PV energy scale and, and, and 
um, ask uh, what does the PV um, uh, uh, sky looks like. And then I'll spend some time um, uh, discussing properties of the planned CTA extragalactic survey, a very uniform uh, survey of the extragalactic uh, sky and, and how it can um, help us to um, uh, determine the gamma ray luminosity function. Okay, and then I'll just summarize. Um, uh, again, um, interrupt me um, whenever you, you want, okay? Uh, so a few questions uh, that we want to, uh, to answer here, okay? So how do AGNs are distributed in redshift and, and luminosity? So this is an important question because this has to do with um, uh, structure formation in the universe, how AGNs are formed, what, what, uh, what is their initial mass function, so how massive do uh, uh, an AGN uh, start? Um, and um, what is the process for it to gain in mass? We know that uh, AGNs accrete matter uh, along their history, but uh, they can also uh, um, acquire mass by mergers. So uh, all these questions are related uh, and somehow um, through the uh, gamma ray luminosity function. Uh, then uh, how those AGN properties evolve with redshift? Uh, again, this has to do with cosmology, um, the expansion of the universe, uh, structured formation. Um, and then, um, for example, what is the contribution uh, of these uh, AGN emissions to what we call the isotropic gamma ray background? We know that there is a diffuse emission um, in many wavelengths, but uh, uh, also at, at, at gamma ray um, energies. And, uh, uh, so, and, and, and uh, we believe that AGNs contribute at least uh, to a fraction of these uh, isotropic background. And then, um, and then another question is, um, what is the best way if we want to probe parameters of the, of the AGN uh, uh, gamma ray luminosity function? Uh, and the, the answer is, uh, you have to do a survey as uniform as you can, okay? So you have to choose uh, uh, an area large enough in the sky and scan that region as uniformly as you can, uh, because you're, you're, um, you want to retrieve information on, on redshift distribution and luminosity distribution, so the, 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 the scan has to be uniform, otherwise you introduce biases um, in your analysis, okay? Um, and, and what we know so far about the GLF, uh, so basically what we know so far about the GLF comes uh, mostly, uh, almost exclusively from the GEV energy range. Uh, and for that, uh, the data from Fermilat is, is very important. Um, and then another question is what is likely to be the extragalactic sky seen by CTA. So CTA will push the energy scale to the TEV, from the GEV to the TEV energy scale. So then, then there is this question, what sky will CTA likely to see? Um, and then, um, and how else CTA will determine the parameters of the GLF. And um, you will see that um, so far we have to rely on, on phenomenological parametrizations that uh, don't have much physics in it. So you can um, ask yourself if you can take a further step and put some more physics in, into those um, uh, studies. Um, and, and that's basically um, the kind of questions that we want to to answer here. Um, okay, so AGN versus normal galaxies. Um, so we know that some galaxies, they, they have a very broad spectrum with emission essentially across the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And that's, uh, for example, a typical example here, uh, the luminosity of a given um, um, galaxy in units of the solar luminosity uh, over a broad range of, of frequencies. Um, and you can see here a typical quasar uh, spectrum compared to a typical galaxy spectrum. So there's a huge difference. The um, spectrum of a galaxy is pretty much contained into uh, a region that goes from ultraviolet passing through visible all the way to infrared. Uh, even so, it's, it's very um, compact in frequency space um, and there's an ex explanation for that, the uh, luminosity, uh, the flux of a galaxy can be uh, approximated by a superposition of uh, black body spectrums, okay? So you just uh, say that the stellar 
atmospheres emit essentially as a black body with a given temperature. Typical temperatures for stellar um, 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 atmospheres range from 3,000 Kelvin to 40,000 Kelvin. So the spectrum, if you assume a Planck distribution, would be basically contained uh, in this um, um, wavelength range here from 4,000 uh, angstroms to 20,000 angstroms. Um, but a quasar uh, doesn't look like that. So that is an indication that whatever is driving this emission, it's a non-thermal process. Um, and their luminosity, you can also see by the difference uh, in, in the y-axis here, that uh, the luminosity of, uh, of, um, of uh, NAGN, like a quasar, um, is much larger than a, than a normal galaxy, at least uh, 1,000 times more luminous than a normal galaxy. Um, okay, so, um, and this very high emission, at least a thousand times uh, the luminosity of a normal galaxy, is not coming from the whole galaxy, it's coming from a very particular region of the galaxy, the very core of the object, and you can see that if you uh, uh, observe a galaxy uh, with different exposure times. So for lo um, a smaller um, observational times, you will basically see the core of the, of the AGN, and then you need much more time, much more observation time, in order to see the whole galaxy. Um, so this is coming from the very center of the galaxy, and uh, what we, uh, we interpret this nowadays um, as the presence of a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, and, and the supermassive black hole is active, it's accreting matter. Okay, um, uh, here are a few properties. If you compare the luminosity of an AGN in, in units of the solar masses, uh, you will see basically at the several classes here, normal galaxies, radio galaxies, Cepher galaxies, uh, quasars, all these uh, we interpret as, as AGNs. And then uh, we're gonna focus on these two kinds of objects here. And you can see that in terms of luminosity, uh, they're much, much, much more luminous than normal galaxies. Uh, luminosities can reach up to 10 to the 14 um, solar, solar uh, luminosity, uh, while, uh, whereas a normal galaxy uh, typically will have um, a luminosity less than 10,000 uh, um, uh, solar luminosities. Um, and and uh, here are some estimates for the mass of the, of the black hole, of the central black hole, and you can see that for quasars and, 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 and blazers especially, you can have um, black hole masses of the order of uh, a billion um, uh, solar masses at the center. Um, nowadays, there is um, kind of a um, unified AGN model, uh, um, and uh, people argue that uh, all these different objects that appeared in the, in the previous table, they are a, 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 the same class of objects, but observed with different viewing angles with respect to the, to the jet, because um, usually what you have in an AGN is a central uh, um, massive black hole accreting matter, so the matter is being accreted through um, an accretion disk here, and then you have a relativistic jet of, of particles emanating um, at least in one direction, sometimes in two. Uh, and uh, it is also believed that in, at least in some of them, you have a kind of an obscuring, um, obscuring object, which in this case is uh, represented here by, by a torus, a dust torus. So depending on the viewing angle of the uh, observer, you might be observing the AGN um, along the jet, a little bit inclined, uh, but a little bit off axis, uh, or at high uh, angles, observational angles, and that will change the spectrum of the AGN, uh, uh, especially in the optical. And some of those classifications that I've shown in the last table, they basically depend on, on how the AGN look like, looks like in the, um, in the optical part of the spectrum. Um, so blazers, which is this class that I'm going to focus on in this talk, um, we believe that the observer is uh, seeing this object uh, very close to the uh, relativistic jet. And that has consequences um, because this is a jet of relativistic particles, so you will have Doppler effect um, and, um, and things like that. So the emission will be very uh, bimmed, uh, so even if in the rest frame of the particles in the jet, 
they are emitting isotropically, uh, they will look like for an observer a very, very um, beamed emission, uh, just by uh, uh, relativistic beaming effect. And also uh, the intensity, you will have an effect on the intensity. So this is the brightness of, of the AGN measured in the laboratory and the brightness of the AGN in the rest frame. Um, again, due to Doppler effect, uh, you will have a, a, a you can have a, a very large difference between these two brightness depending on the viewing angle, okay, and on the beta and gamma factors of the particles in the beam. Okay. Um, so as a consequence of beaming, uh, uh, for blazers we believe that the emission is completely uh, dominated by the, by the jet. So the host galaxy will be completely overshined by the luminosity of the jet. Um, okay, so I told you uh, that most of those nomenclature in, in the previous table were um, related to optical properties of the AGN. Here I show two um, different kinds of, of blazers. So blazers break into two, into these two categories here, BLLAC and flat spectrum radio quasar. And this nomenclature basically comes from the optical properties of the spectrum. If you look, uh, this is a typical optical spectrum for a BLLAC. So you see a kind of a power law behavior in the optical, no emission on ab absorption lines, uh, whereas in, in flat spectrum radio quasar, you see the spectrum is overall flat, but with uh, several emission lines, okay? Um, and that has a consequence. It means that uh, to determine redshift for a flat spectrum radio quasar, it's uh, relatively easy, easy. You, you know, just uh, identify some, some emission lines and, and and, and get the redshift, but for BLAC this is a problem. Uh, so this is uh, one of the main problems uh, regarding uh, the termination of, of uh, redshift for, for BLACs. It's hard to get an estimate on the redshift, so you have to you know, rely on stuff like uh, Lyman Alpha Forest or, or things like that to get upper limits at least uh, in the redshift. Um, so again, blazers have their jets pointed close to the line of sight. They are the most common extragalactic sources emitting gamma rays because of this beaming effect. So they can be observed at very, very high redshift. Um, so they basically dominate the population of extragalactic sources emitting gamma rays. Um, they are highly, they have highly variable emission. Again, we believe that this is, this is related to beaming effects also, because if, if you have small changes in the structure of the beam due to that gamma factor, uh, these get amplified uh, very easily. So it's, it's uh, common that you see highly variable emission uh, coming from blazers. Um, so this I already talked about, that there, this lack of emission and absorption optical -like, uh, lines for BLAC means that it's, it's hard to, to get redshift estimates for, for this object. To give you an idea, uh, nowadays around 50% of Fermi's BLAC lack um, direct determination of, of, of redshift. And, um, and of course, due to this, um, the evolution of BLX is unclear. For flat spectrum radio quasar, the situation is, is uh, more positive. Uh, the data seems to indicate uh, what we call a positive cosmic evolution uh, for flat spectrum radio quasar, uh, at least up to some cutoff uh, redshift. What that means, positive uh, cosmic evolution, there were more flat spectrum radio quasars at high redshift than at low redshift, at least to a certain um, uh, cutoff, okay? Uh, so that is not so clear for, for BLX uh, um, exactly because uh, it's hard to get that redshift. Okay, so now I'll, I'll move to the uh, second part of the talk. Um, where I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit what the GV uh, sky uh, looks like, um, at least as, as far as uh, AGN emission is concerned or blazer emission is concerned, and, and what do we know so far about these uh, gamma ray luminosity functions. Um, so what we know about the um, gamma ray luminosity uh, function comes almost exclusively, exclusively from uh, uh, Fermi data. Here just a summary of, of the uh, um, Fermi telescope detectors. So Fermi is a telescope um, uh, on orbit, 
uh, it is, it has a particle detector on orbit. Basically, um, uh, it's better to look here. So you have a, a, what, what they call the tracker, uh, an anti-coincidence uh, particle detector on the top and the calorimeter at the bottom. Um, so the uh, anti-coincidence detector is used to uh, veto charged particles. So anytime a charged particle crosses the anti-coincidence, um, you will basically, you know, uh, disregard this, this as, a, as a gamma ray. So it's, it's probably an electron or, or, or a proton or, or a charged particle, any other charged particle. And then photons will enter the tracker and will convert into electron uh, positron pairs. So by measuring the tracks, uh, you can reconstruct the um, energy, and, well, you can reconstruct the direction of the, of the photon. And then the calorimeter at the bottom part gives you an energy measurement of, of the photon. Uh, at the bottom of the telescope, you also have a gamma um, burst monitoring instrument. Um, so um, Fermi is in a, let's see if I can get, Fermi is in a low uh, altitude orbit. Uh, so the Earth has, makes some shadow, of course, in the detector. So you have to point uh, away from the Earth. Um, so uh, in one single orbit, it will point in this case uh, in the direction of the northern hemisphere. And then after one orbit, it shifts the uh, telescope axis and scan the sou southern hemisphere. So in this way, at every two orbits, you basically scan the whole sky in a very, very uniform way. Okay, So that's the best uh, you can do if you want to uh, do um, AGN population studies because you cover the sky very uniformly uh, uh, so that doesn't introduce a bias um, uh, uh, in, your, in your analysis. Um, and, and that's what Fermi um, gives us in terms of the um, GV sky. So that's the Fermi LAT all sky map after several years of operation. You can see the uh, galaxy shining in gamma rays, uh, but you also see um, point-like emission at very high latitude uh, and also some diffuse emission across the whole sky. Um, so since we, since we are interested in blazers, these uh, are blazers identified by Fermi. So you can see that they pop up uh, everywhere in the sky. So they are not correlated with the galaxy. So these are extragalactic um, uh, sources. Um, and uh, so then you can use these uh, to study these probability distribution function that I've mentioned in, in the beginning. Now you can ask yourself, uh, given that data, what is the probability to find a given blazer at a given redshift with a given luminosity with a certain photon index, for example, okay? Uh, that's what the GLF gives you. So here's one parametrization that was fitted to uh, the first year of, 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 of uh, Fermi, first year of data taken in Fermi. Uh, it's a parametrization that has uh, some, uh, a function that, that gives you a, a kind of a local gamma ray luminosity function, and then a part that tells you how that luminosity function evolves with redshift and luminosity. It's a uh, redshift and, uh, um, it's a luminosity dependent redshift evolution in, in this case. Um, they tried to fit only something that didn't have this, uh, this evolution, but it, it doesn't fit the data uh, pretty well. So they included um, uh, this uh, luminosity dependent redshift evolution. Um, so there are several parameters popping up here. Um, this is a completely phenomenological um, approach, uh, but that's what uh, people uh, have been doing uh, so far. Uh, if you try to describe the data with this parametrization, this is um, what, you, what you have. So here's the distribution of, of uh, AGN, in, th in this case, BLAC counts as a function of redshift, the distribution of BLAC uh, counts as a function of luminosity, and the distribution uh, as a function of the photon index. Um, um, so this fit was done using uh, 211 BLAC objects uh, with a high uh, s uh, detection significance 
and these are VLX away from the uh, uh, galactic plane. Uh, here you had that problem, so you had to uh, estimate the redshift of the VLX, so they used um, uh, a bunch of techniques here. Um, in some cases you had some weak uh, emission lines, so you could do spectroscopy, uh, but in general they use photometry uh, to get the redshift um, or Lyman alpha force and things like that to at least have an, an upper limit uh, uh, on the redshift. And then, um, uh, and of course, um, this is not the, the total amount of VLX that we have in the universe. Um, so you have to, to uh, correct for selection effects and they, they did that by simulating the, the detector and calculating the detection efficiency. Um, um, if you just take that parameterization and plot it as a function of redshift, luminosity and spectral index, that's what you, you get. Um, so as far as the Fermilat, the first year Fermilat data is concerned, above 10 GeVs, you could estimate what is the total amount of VLX in, in flat spectrum radio quasars that we have in the universe. And that's the kind of numbers that, that, that show up. Um, you would have around 8,000 8, VLX um, uh, with emission above 10 GeV in all right shifts and, and something around uh, 1100 uh, flat spectrum radio quasar. These are the parameters that are fitted uh, to, the, to the Fermi data. Um, and you can see here, for example, that um, the Fermi data uh, tells that the spectrum of uh, VLX are, uh, the spectra of VLX are um, slightly harder than, than the spectra of uh, flat spectrum radio quasars. Um, there seems to be a break in the luminosity distribution, okay, around 10 to the, four, around 10 to the 47 uh, ergs per second. And uh, that break is, is also slightly different for, for a flat spectrum uh, compared to BLI, okay? Uh, but again, these things are, have, they have, um, they have um, large uncertainties uh, because the sample is, is, uh, is very limited in size, okay? Um, questions? Uh, okay, so um, now we jump from the GV energy scale to the TV energy scale, okay? So uh, the uh, sensitivity of Fermi uh, degrades fast as you, um, you know, cross the, uh, the 10 GV or 100 GV um, uh, energy scale. Uh, because it is a small detector, so it has a, a small collecting area. Um, so at the TV energy scale, the flux is, is also, um, uh, so at the TV energy scale, you don't have effective area to collect enough photons, and also the showers start to leak um, outside the, the, the Fermi uh, calorimeter. Um, so at the TV energy scale, you have to use a different technique, right? We cannot just put a, a satellite on uh, on orbit to, to measure these TV photons. Uh, we need uh, more effective area. Uh, so here we use a completely different technique, uh, which is called the imaging air shrink of uh, telescope technique. Uh, in this technique, you uh, explore the fact that the, that the atmosphere is um, opaque to, to TV uh, photons, or around TV photons, so these uh, a primary photon will interact in the top of the atmosphere and start a shower, um, a shower of particles. Uh, this shower of particles, they have relativistic uh, particles in it, uh, particles with a velocity larger than the speed of light in the air. So you have the emission of shrink of photons. So these photons can reach the ground. Uh, so just to, have you, uh, to give you an idea, uh, on average, one TV primary photon will give rise to something uh, around 100 photons per square meter, uh, 100 shrink of photons per square meter um, at the ground level. Uh, and the size of the shrink of pool, more or less the size of the shrink of pool, is um, a disk with a radius uh, of around 100 meters. And that's effectively your, collect, your collection area in this case. So we are talking about effective detection areas of 50,000 square meters, okay? So much higher than, than Fermi on space. Uh, so if you place uh, telescopes, 
that can collect the shrink of light. In principle, you can uh, do the reverse engineering and, and, um, um, and get information about the primary uh, gamma ray, like the um, incoming direction and, and the energy, okay? So this is a very short pulse, so it's like a, around five nanoseconds pulse uh, as the photons uh, reach the ground. So you need a fast electronics uh, to catch this, this photons, okay? Um, and it was not until the last 40 years, maybe, that we had um, electronics to, to actually um, get this fast signal. So, uh, so here you place a, a telescope inside the Cherenkov pool, okay? Then uh, you intercept part of this Cherenkov photons. Uh, so if you have a, the reflector here and then a camera, close to the focal plane. That's the kind of images that you're going to see forming uh, in, your, um, in your detector. Um, this, is, in fact, is more um, consistent with a muon just crossing the, uh, the, the telescope mirror, okay? So as I said, you have a, fl a flash of light in the blue to ultraviolet um, with a width around five nanoseconds. Um, and uh, again, here's the a representation of the of the shower. Uh, so these ellipses here show more or less the density of particles uh, in the shower, and then they emit shrink of light, which is then uh, reflected and and mapped into the focal plane. Okay. Uh, so here's a typical image that you will have uh, forming in in the camera, and then you can get um, uh, information about shower the shower axis, for example. Um, um, and then you have, you have this problem that, um, in principle, this is not a background-free uh, measurement. Uh, we don't just have photons just reaching the top of the atmosphere. You have a, a much larger flux of, of cosmic rays, um, so you have to get rid of this. Uh, on average, for every single uh, photon shower, you're going to have uh, as much as 1,000 times um, uh, cosmic rays, so you have to do background rejection. We can do that in, in these techniques because if you uh, just analyze the kind of images that uh, are formed in the in the camera, you will see stuff like this for a gamma ray shower, typically an ellipse. But if a, a cosmic ray uh, um, uh, induces the shower, you see a much more irregular imaging uh, f image forming in, in in the camera. So just by um, analyzing the the image shape, you can do background rejection. Uh, for a hadronic, you can see a hadronic shower as kind of a superposition of, of, of several electromagnetic showers uh, because the transverse momentum in a hadronic shower is larger than in an electromagnetic shower, and that gives you a superposition of showers that uh, change the shape of the image in, in the camera. Um, uh, and then you can go one step further with this technique, and instead of using one single telescope, you can put several telescopes uh, inside the shrink of pool and do what we call a stereoscopic detection. Um, that helps a lot uh, in terms of angular resolution, energy resolution, and also background rejection. Um, because you can combine, so here's uh, is, uh, the images of in the camera of each telescope, in this case was a four, uh, for a telescope detection, so you can uh, you can mount a single image, and then you can have a much better determination of the uh, photon direction. Okay, so this is what we call stereoscopic uh, uh, detection. It improves the angular resolution. It also improves the energy resolution, and um, and reduces the the these um, uh, photon hadron um, um, uh, this, the hadron contamination into the photon sample. Um, so these are, uh, this is the current generation of IACTs in operation. We have essentially three um, uh, telescope arrays uh, working, MAGIC in the Canary Island, HES in, in Namibia, and, and VERITAS um, in, in Arizona. So you can see they all explore the stereoscopic um, uh, technique. Uh, and, and the TV sky is basically uh, measured by um, at least the gamma ray uh, TV sky is, is um, uh, measured by these guys and some other um, uh, surface detectors uh, 
in operation. Um, so here's the, the TV sky, at least the, the situation back in 2019. Yeah, I think I did this plot in 2019. Um, these are the TV emitters. Again, there's a population of TV emitters um, in the galactic plane, and then um, a population of uh, high latitude uh, emitters. Uh, so in this case here, we could identify 54 uh, TV emitters, which were blazers, uh, six flat, flat spectrum and 48 BLX. Uh, you can see here their distribution of redshift um, and, and the spectral index. And um, okay, so if you want to um, do AGN population studies um, using these TV emitters, now you have to be a little bit more careful in the GV to the TV energy range because what, we me what you measure is not actually what was emitted and it's, and it's not just a, a matter of, of one over R square um, uh, dilution of the, of the flux, but you have stuff happening during the propagation of these gamma rays uh, as I told you in the beginning of the presentation, uh, the extragalactic uh, sky or the extragalactic medium is not transparent to this GV to TV uh, photons. Um, so you have to account for that. Um, oops, sorry. Um, because um, as these photons, these high energy photons, they propagate through the extragalactic medium, they start to interact with low energy photons uh, and produce uh, E plus E minus pairs, okay? Uh, in such a way that if you have a certain, I don't know, certain intrinsic spectrum being emitted at the Earth, due to this absorption on the way to Earth, here's a pictorial representation of a high absorption um, a situation, you will measure something more along the red line. Um, here is, um, a cartoon of what would be a low absorption um, a scenario, okay? Uh, these low energy photons uh, with which the high energy ones uh, interact is called in general the background light. So you somehow need to understand the properties of the background light if you want to relate your measure the spectrum to the intrinsic one, okay? Um, and the process behind this is what we call the bright Wheeler process. So this is a very clean QED process in which a very high energy photon interacts with a low energy extragalactic background light photon and produces an E plus E minus pair. Uh, so you can do this calculation in QED, at least at tree level. Uh, and the cross section is um, pretty much none. Um, it will depend on the energy of the high energy photon, on the energy, sorry, on the energy of the low energy photon, the extragalactic background light, the energy of the high energy photon, the GV to TV photon, and the scattering angle, okay? Um, uh, so the cross section has a dependence on this beta, has a, has a peak at some value of, of, of beta, um, and it has a well-defined threshold. So uh, the threshold for that reaction to happen is given by the um, uh, rest energy, um, uh, well, it's related to the rest energy of the E plus E minus uh, pair. Right? Um, okay, um, so, and this is not a rare process. You could uh, think that this is a rare process, but if you look at the, um, at the Feynman diagram, so this is as likely as Compton scattering, right? Um, so we are talking about the cross sections of the order, uh, the, the, we are talking about the Thompson cross section, okay? So uh, things, things on the order of 10 to the minus 25 centimeters square. So at least from the point of view of the fundamental process, this is not a rare process, okay? It's as, as I said, it's as likely as, as Compton scattering. Um, and that has a very, um, um, uh, um, has a strong impact on the propagation of photons across the universe. Okay. So uh, in the sense that the mean free path, that the mean free path of a photon as a function of its energy can vary a lot, uh, okay? So uh, here around 10 to the 12 electron volts, so, so this is the TV energy scale, so that's what we are interested here. 
uh, from the TV and GV energy scale. Uh, these photons will typically have mean free paths around uh, 100 megaparsec. Um, and here, they are basically interacting with the extragalactic background light in the optical to the infrared, basically, optical to infrared. But then as, as soon as the energy approaches one PV, 10 to the 15 electron volts, the mean free pass just drops um, very sharply. Uh, so that around 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 16 electron volts, the mean free path is of the order of 10 kiloparsec. Okay, so this is galactic uh, scale. This is galactic scale. Uh, so the message here is that uh, around 1 PV and 10 PV, uh, the mean free pass is of the order of our galaxy. So we should be seeing photons essentially coming from the Milky Way or places nearby. Okay, um, and then as the energy keeps going up. Um, the mean free pass recovers a bit, but then you start to interact with the radio background. By the way, so here I said that you were basically interacting with infrared all the way to optical, and then here uh, you are basically interacting with the CMB, cosmic microwave background, okay? And since you have a lot of these photons hanging around in the extragalactic medium, so the mean free path uh, drops uh, really fast. And then uh, you start to recover a bit, and then you start to interact with the radio background, okay? Um, so in some sense, you need to have an idea on what is the density of photons at each one of these uh, spectral re uh, re uh, regions here, radio, uh, microwave, and then infrared and optical, and, and other wavelengths. Um, so this is the situation right now. Uh, what we know from the experimental point of view uh, of all these uh, diffuse backgrounds, right? So we know a lot about the microwaves. Huh? So Kolb has proven that uh, the CMB is basically a black body, the best you can have, um, with a very well-defined temperature. Uh, but then we do have the optical and the infrared background. Uh, this is usually associated to the extragalactic background light. So. Um, but we, in principle, we would have a UV background, an X-ray background, and a gamma ray background. So this is all diffuse, huh? isotropic uh, background. So this is not associated to point-like sources. Um, and you have a radio background as well. Um, so you can see some regions here where there's clearly a lack of information, right? So here in the middle, so there is a lack of data here. So this is the mid-infrared, mid-infrared. So we have a lack of measurements in the mid-infrared. And, and, and this is particularly important for, for the measurements of CTA. The CTA will push the energy spectra to the TV energy region. And it turns out that at, at a TV, uh, the most important photons during this uh, um, interaction, this gamma-gamma interaction, is actually in the mid-infrared, exactly at the mid-infrared. If you then go to higher energies like uh, 10 TV, 10 to 20 TV, then they will start to interact uh, with, the f with the far infrared, with the far infrared. But, uh, but for sure, uh, when CTA will start taking data, the mid-infrared region will be uh, very important. So there's another big gap here, which is UV. UV, so UV, there's also a lack of, of information on the, on the diffuse background. Um, there is a reason for that, at least we, 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 we think we know the reason, is that uh, it, the universe is also opaque to UV, right? Because they start to ionize hydrogen. Um, so you don't get much of these UV photons here at, at Earth. Um, and of course you have the X-ray region, which was explored by other telescopes, and also the gamma ray region. Here, EGRAT, and Fermilab did a, did a good job in, in, in uh, measuring the extra um, um, uh, the, the diffuse background. Um, but the message is you have to know all these diffuse backgrounds um, uh, in order to account for absorption um, from very far away in energetic sources. Um, so here's just the optical depth. So since you have an absorption in, on the way to Earth, you can calculate an optical depth uh, for a source at a given redshift 
emitting at a given energy. Uh, so again, it will involve uh, a convolution of the cross-section with the, with the number density of low energy photons in the extragalactic medium, integrated over all uh, X scattering angles and uh, overall redshifts. So you can um, plot things like this, the optical depth as a function of the energy of the gamma ray photon and as a function of the redshift of the source. Um, there's a line here crossing the plot associated to tau equal one. Um, so this marks what we call the cosmic gamma ray horizon. Um, so you can see that attenuation effects will be important below tau equal one and, sorry, we will not be important at uh, below tau equal one and will be important in this, in this uh, region here above tau equal one. Um, so in such a way that if you, this is a simulation, okay, this is a synthetic source. So if you put a source emitting as a power law, like the black line here, and you put this source at different redshift, uh, you will see a different, fo uh, a different spectrum at Earth. So you first, around uh, 100 uh, GeV, uh, you start seeing the absorption due to interaction with the optical background light. And then some, somehow, when you enter this region between 1 TV to 10 TV, you start to interact with the mid-infrared, mid-infrared, and you see a second break, okay? So of course, this is the perfect situ situation, right? Um, uh, real life is, is not as easy because these spectrum are measured in this region with a very low statistics, so you have very few photons uh, reaching the telescope, so it's, it's not as clear as, as it is represented here um, to, see the, to see the absorption, okay? But basically, the spectrum at Earth will be the spectrum at the source multiplied by an exponential factor that depends on the, on the optical depth. Um, so this is real data now. So this is um, data from Fermi. Um, uh, this catalog, the 2FHL, in this energy range from 50, to 50 GV to 2 TV, um, where what you have here is basically you take these um, point-like sources, so this is dominated by blazers, you take these point-like sources and you um, identify what is the highest photon coming from that source, okay? The source is at a given redshift and emits photons with a given maximum energy given by these dots here. So you plot them in this energy redshift uh, um, um, space, and that's what you have. Um, the lines here uh, represent uh, the cosmic gamma ray horizon, the tau equal one lines, for different models of the EBL, of the extragalactic uh, background light. Um, and you see that the, the data uh, tends to accumulate below tau equal one. So that is interpreted as an evidence um, of absorption, okay? Um, there's another evidence of, of absorption here. Um, you, you fit the spectrum, so you fit the spectrum of these blazers, uh, and you look how the photon index, okay, the spectral index, um, uh, behaves for different classes of sources. Here are three classes of sources um, that you can see that they differ um, essentially um, by the energy range, so you see that this tree lack is kind of a low energy sample uh, where you will have photons typically from 0.1 to 100 GV, then you have an intermediate energy sample with photons between 10 and 500 GV, and a high energy sample from 50 to uh, 2,000 GV. Uh, and uh, so they're here, uh, the gray points are the low energy sample, the blue points, the intermediate energy sample, and the red points, the high energy sample. So you see that as you increase the energy, there's kind of a running of the spectral index. So there's a, clearly, a clear tendency of the spectral index to increase. So the spectrums measured at Earth are becoming softer. And the farther the source is, the softer the spectrum. 
So that would be another evidence, or interpreted as an evidence for, for absorption. Okay. Um, Okay, now I'll jump to the PV sky. So we explored the GV sky, then we pass to the TV sky, and now we go to the PV sky. What does the PV sky look like? Um, and um, at the, the PV sky is a bit different. Um, so we don't have measurements of PV uh, um, uh, sources with uh, shrink of telescopes. What we have are these um, surface array of, of, of particles uh, that are sensitive also to, to gamma ray showers. Um, you basically sample uh, the shower particle at a, at a fixed uh, altitude. Uh, so here's, for example, results of one of these uh, surface arrays, LASSO, in, in China. And um, these guys, they measured PV emission of uh, photon uh, uh, PV emission um, and here are three examples of three sources uh, with PV emission that they identified. Um, so you can see uh, here uh, photons uh, arriving at the, um, uh, reaching the PV scale. So the, the highest energy photon in these measurements is 1.4 uh, para electron volt. So 1.4 times 10 to the 15 electron volts. Um, all these sources are in the galactic plane Okay, um, here they did two fit to the intrinsic spectrum. There's a, there's a power law fit uh, represented by the dotted line. And then there's a, a intrinsic spectrum with some curvature, with some curvature. Um, and then you fit the observed spectrum accounting for absorption, accounting for absorption. So the D absorbed spectrum is the is the dotted line, which which is almost on top of the of the black line. So it means that absorption is there, but it's it's not in pretty much important for this for these three sources, and they are all in the galactic plane. So this is the region where the where the sources are. Okay, so this is the sky map of of, of Lasso above 100 TV. So these are their uh, sky coverage. So this is uh, an observatory in the Northern Hemisphere, so they don't have uh, full sky coverage. Um, so, um, and you can see that the galactic center is, is just below their field of view. Um, so this is a region that they explored and all those three sources, they are in the galactic plane. So this is a zoom of this, of this region. So in fact, they, they identified 12 sources uh, in the galactic plane with uh, emission, um, with emission, um, sorry, with emission above, uh, above 100 TV, sorry. And, um, and if you look at, the, at their sky map, so you, you also see the Crab Nebula, um, you don't see much thing happening away from the from the galactic plane, right? At the PV scale, at the PV scale. Um, of course, this is, a, 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 this is a data collected in the first years of operation. LASSO has been operated for a couple of years. Um, uh, but again, the first thing that you see is the stuff in the galactic plane and nothing away, essentially nothing away from the galactic plane. That would be consistent with that idea that PV photons have a very short mean free path, right? We would expect that uh, at PV, we would see basically the galaxy and maybe some stuff around, huh? some satellite galaxies and things like that. Um, but again, this is, this is a result that is being, um, that will be updated. Maybe s some, some activity will start to pop up away from the galactic plane. But at least from the point of view of the discussion that we just had, we, will, we don't have uh, much hope to see PV emission from very far away sources, okay? Um, um, and here's just a, a plot to show you the co comparison of, uh, between sensitivities of, of different experiments. We've been talking about Fermi, uh, so you can see here uh, the, the Fermi sensitivity curves, and as I said, uh, as when you reach um, 100, for example, uh, 100 uh, uh, GV, uh, 
the sensitivity of Fermi is already pretty bad. So you can see here the sensitivity of these uh, shrink of telescopes like Magic and Veritas, which are currently taking data. Um, and then uh, you have here the sensitivity of one of these uh, surface detector arrays like Hulk in, in, in Mexico and in Lhasso that I've just uh, shown here. Uh, and also the sensitivity curves for CTA, okay? CTA is the next generation of uh, imaging air shrink of telescopes. Uh, it has a northern array and a sounder array. And you can see that um, this, the peak sensitivity for CTA is somewhere in between 1 TeV and 10 TeV, 1 and 10 TeV, okay? And another point that, would, that I would like to stress here is that you have to be careful when comparing these um, sensitivity curves because um, in the case of shrink of telescopes like CTA, Veritas, and, and, and MAGIC, you point the telescope to a very specific area in the sky. Um, and here is the sensitivity for a point-like source. So if you put a point-like source somewhere in the sky, you point your telescope for that, uh, to that direction and measure for a given time, in this case, 50 hours. So this curve tells you with 50 hours of ob observation, what is the minimum flux that you're sensitive to in that case. Uh, whereas for um, surface arrays, you have this huge field of view, instantaneous field of view, and you're collecting basically everything inside that field of view, okay? So uh, you have to be careful when, when comparing this uh, sensitivity, okay? So here, are, for example, is a sensitivity for, for SWGO, which is another of these uh, surface detectors, which is being planned to be installed someplace in the Sounder Hemisphere, probably in South America. And what would be the sensitivity of F SWGO for five years of operation? And again, it has a, a, a very large instantaneous aperture, a very large instantaneous field of view. Uh, with, so with these two observatories uh, together, LASSO in the Northern Hemisphere and SWGO in the Southern Hemisphere, we would have uh, full sky coverage. So you could access all these uh, blind uh, part of the sky um, right now. Okay? So LASSO doesn't see also a very small region around the nor North Pole, the Northern Pole. So, so this hole here is the, is the Northern uh, Hemisphere. Uh, the northern pole, okay, of the of the Earth. Um, um, so just um, going on with this discussion on um, on absorption. Uh, so if you have a very uniform um, survey of the sky, you can start learning what is the distribution of AGNs across the universe in redshift, in luminosity. Um, and um, and once you have that population, have a, a very well measured population of of these blazers, and measure their spectrum, you can even start doing some cosmology if if you want. Um, it turns out that the moving volume emissivity of these low energy photons, extra galactic background light photons, one way to get them is to know. Uh, what is called the galaxy luminosity function, okay? So what is the probability to find a galaxy at a given redshift with a given luminosity? Then if you multiply by the luminosity, integrate over all luminosity, you have a, an idea on how many photons uh, or what is the emissivity of these photons. Uh, you can also transform these into a number density of photons at a given redshift with a given energy. And we already dis discussed that the contributions to the EBL uh, you have contributions in the ultraviolet and optical, and we interpret that as, as, as being uh, due to starlight. But you also have emissions, in, you also have uh, contributions from infrared, and the way we understand that is that it, that is coming from dust emission inside galaxies. You can also think about AGN emission through the accretion process, so the disks of AGNs uh, they have matter at high temperature, so they could in principle contribute uh, to the optical and even x-rays. Um, but you can also think about more, I don't know, hypothetical emissions like, like emissions coming from the first population of stars. Huh? Um, 
we nowadays believe that the first stars that were formed in, in the universe were kind of different than the ones that we see nowadays, right? They were more massive. Um, so these are called pop three and pop two stars. And I don't know, uh, more exotic emissions. Uh, there's people that explore um, uh, dark matter, uh, annihilation contributions to the EBL and stuff like, stuff like that. Um, and uh, so if you want to, um, if you want to model the brightness of the EBL at a, at a given uh, reg, at a given wavelength, at a given time in the universe, you have to basically solve a Boltzmann equation. And this Boltzmann equation has two uh, contributions. There's one here, uh, which I'm associating to the expansion. So you see that the two terms, they differ by one, one sign. Um, so this term is due to expansion. So as the universe expands, it tends to dilute the, the, the EBL photon density. And there's a source term. So here is where you're gonna put stars, dust, agent emission, whatever you want. Um, if you solve this equation, um, you get a formal solution like this. So you want the brightness of the EBL in watts per square meter per hertz per stair radian. Uh, you're gonna have to integrate the co-moving emissivity and of course, you're gonna have to know how fast the universe is, is, is expanding. So that's the, that's the recipe uh, in order to build your EBL model. So basically in order to build your EBL model, you need, a mo you need to assume something um, about the source of EBL uh, at a given wavelength and a given redshift in a, in a cosmological model. Um, here's an, some summary of the ingredients that uh, enter in this calculation. So what do you have to put inside JC, this moving luminosity? In this case, there are some ingredients here. So, so here is the, this is the contribution coming from the sources. In this particular model, the sources are basically stars and dust inside galaxies, basically. Um, so the first ingredient is uh, what we call the star formation rate. So uh, at which rate the stars are being born uh, in the universe? So there are a few models here, uh, at least five different models of star formation rate. Um, then once you know the rate at which stars are being formed, another thing that you need to know is how massive are these stars when they are born? So this is called the initial mass function. So here are two models of initial mass function. This one is, is, is very um, well, well known, it's very used. It's the Salpeter uh, initial mass function. So the Salpeter initial mass function basically assumes that the initial mass function at any redshift is the same as in the Milky Way. Okay, basically like that. And then when you have the initial mass function, you can place this star somewhere in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram and follow the stellar, stellar evolution of the star uh, as it moves across the main sequence or take one of these uh, roots, uh, one of these branches. And we know that the star stellar evolution depends on the, on the initial mass, okay? Then in this model, since dust is also emitting, you have an extra piece of information uh, which is, so we believe that the stars are emitting um, in the optical and UV, and then part of these optical and UV emission is absorbed by the dust in the galaxy, reprocessed and re-emitted in infrared. So you need to know, for example, what is the escape probability? What is the probability of a photon coming from a star escape from the galaxy or being absorbed by, by the dust? And that's this uh, escape fraction here. So this is one way one particular model that is based basically on stellar and, and dust emission. And when you, when you do this calculation with those ingredients, you get something like this. So this is the, um, uh, this is the uh, emissivity of EBL as a function of, uh, of wavelengths. And uh, here you can clearly see the contribution from stars in red, in, in dotted red, and then uh, the contributions of dust. So in this model, there were three uh, grain types of dust. 
there's one grain type that dominates the mid infrared and then two other dust types that dominate the far infrared the far infrared um, if you break up uh, the model in in their uh, components, huh? so the stellar contribution, that's the bolometric uh, intensity for the stellar contribution, and then the three grain types, um, and then the total contribution in a comparison with the CMB, in a comparison with the CMB. So we are talking about um, a radiation field, this EBL, at least in this uh, wavelength range, that is 5% of the CMB energy density, okay? It's not non-negligible, okay? But of course, as, as the CMB takes over, then uh, as we saw, you're gonna have a, a sharp drop in the, in the mean free path um, um, of the EBL. Um, so we, here I'm gonna show, um, how much time do I have? Okay, plenty, <laughs> a lot. Um, here's a case study with a single, um, with a single, a blazer Markarian 501. This is a, a very well known uh, gamma ray emitter. You can see it here uh, in the Hawk sky map. So I mentioned Hawk before. So Hawk is a surface array in, in, in Mexico uh, where it samples the showers when they reach the ground. Uh, so this is a map in equatorial coordinates. So this is the plane of the galaxy. So this is the galactic plane. Um, and you can see clearly Markarian shining here. Um, what is interesting about this source is that um, it is a blazer. It is a blazer, a BL lactide blazer uh, at this redshift and this distance. It's a highly variable uh, source at TEV. So variable that um, in 1997, uh, this source had a flare. Uh, so its um, uh, intensity um, increased a lot. So um, the blue dots here represent the, the spectrum of Marca, the observed spectrum at Earth of Markarian 501 during this flare in 1997. So you see that we had uh, photons reaching the Earth with 20 TV, um, 20 TV. And um, it turns out that for a 20 TV photon, if you calculate the expected ratio of the optical death due to stars, and compared to the optical death due to the, the total optical death, right? And you compare Markarian 501 with all the other TV emitters that we, that we uh, observe, you see that Markarian 501 is the one with the highest expected attenuation uh, by dust emission, by dust emission. It has the lowest ratio for this uh, tall star over um, the total um, optical depth. So you can then ask, so can we, since we, we are in this situation, can we use this uh, uh, spectral energy distribution to start constraining EBL parameters and maybe even cosmological parameters? Uh, so that's the question here. And, and so in order to do that, you're gonna have to uh, assume something about the intrinsic spectrum of Markarian, because um, that's a limitation of this kind of analysis. You have to suppose something about the intrinsic spectrum and then measure uh, the spectrum at Earth and model the absorption and in some way try to fit at the same time the absorption on the way and the intrinsic spectrum. Here we just um, uh, adopted a phenomenological approach where we uh, make different assumptions about the intrinsic spectrum a simple power law or a log parabola or a power law with an exponential cutoff and, and, and try to fit the absorption. What we, want, what we mean with fitting the absorption, we're gonna look at those three different grain types in the, extra in, the, in the galaxy and try to fit the relative contribution of each one of those grains, these Fn fractions. If you do that, you see that you're actually able to fit the, those fractions, uh, this is one type of, of, of dust, um, and this is another type of dust, small grains and, and these special molecules. Um, so you see that the fit is, is actually pretty good um, for, um, 
for any one of those assumptions on the, on, the, on the intrinsic spectrum. But if you look at the best fit values, you see that there's a huge difference. Depending on your assumption on, on, on what is the intrinsic spectrum, you're going to have very different um, 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 fractions for, for some of those dusts. And that's an intrinsic limitation because you, can, because you have a single AGN at a given redshift. Of course, there is, um, um, uh, how do you call, uh, uh, degeneracies between, between intrinsic spectrum and absorption. You can increase absorption and decrease intrinsic, uh, and increase intrinsic spectrum or, or the other way around. So there's an intrinsic um, limitation. Uh, so the only way to start breaking this degeneracy is instead of doing the feed for a single source is to have a population of sources at different redshift. Because even though you're going to have to assume something on the intrinsic spectrum, the EBL model is fixed, for, is, is the same for all the sources. So you start breaking degeneracies. That's what is done here. This is a combined feed. This is data. This is real data. So you take all the TV emitters that we, we know so far, and you try to fit all of them at the same time by doing some assumption in the intrinsic spectrum. Um, and uh, here you can see uh, the constraints, again, for those uh, relative fractions of each uh, uh, grain types. And um, uh, you can see that this, this dust here, this kind of dust, huh, it is that one that dominates the infrared the mid-infrared part of the spectrum. It's this grain here, uh, PAH, that dominates the mid-infrared. And it turns out that for the current sample of TV emitters, or GV to TV emitters, uh, we have a pretty good constraint on this um, on these type of grain. Again, because at TV, you will basically be interacting with the mid-infrared. Uh, but you also have some sensitivity to the small grains and the large grains which are in the far infrared, which emit in the far infrared. Um, but for these guys here, you can see that the, it makes a huge difference if you include Markarian 501 in the fit or not. So in these two first cases, Markarian 501 is in the fit, and in this third case, Markarian 501 is not in the fit. As soon as you remove Markarian 501, you lose completely the sensitivity on the small and the large grain. Uh, but, um, but that doesn't happen in the mid-infrared. Um, so in some way, the current sample of GV and TV emitters uh, are already sensitive to this uh, absorption in the, in the mid-infrared. Uh, but as this situation is expected to change, because CTA will start measuring photons between one TV and 10 or maybe tens of TV, and then the far infrared will start to, be, to become important. And then we, we do expect that CTA will change uh, this picture here. Okay, um, so here's just an example. We also, you can see that we also tested different uh, assumptions on the intrinsic spectrum of Markarian 501. Um, a power, simple power law or a log parabola, and you see that it doesn't make m uh, much difference in terms of the intrinsic spectrum. So the, again, the, these this points here are the measured spectrum, and the black ones are the deabsorbed, the intrinsic Markarian spectrum. And in both cases, you basically recover um, the same intrinsic spectrum. Um, questions? I still have everybody. <laughs> okay, so I'll move to the um, last part of the, of the presentation, which is to explore a little bit what we do actually expect uh, when uh, starts taking data. Uh, more specifically, uh, what will the extra galactic uh, survey of say, bring uh, uh, into the AGN studies, okay? Uh, so CTA, um, I'm sure I think Alicia maybe talked about CTA in, in the past, um, but I'll say a few words uh, again about, about CTA. Um, so CTA is the next generation of imaging air shrink of telescopes, um, and 
so here are the, are the uh, goals. So it's to improve the sensitivity, the current sensitivity, uh, those associated to magic, uh, to has and veritas, by at least one order of magnitude, increase the energy range, so to measure uh, photon emissions all the way from 10 GeV to 100 or even 300 TV, I would say, uh, with a larger field of view, improved angular resolution, uh, a lot of flexibility in operation, and achieve full sky covered. So in order to achieve full sky covered, we need two observatories, one in the south and one in the northern hemisphere. So this is a, an artistic um, uh, representation. You see here telescopes of different sizes, uh, small telescopes, medium-sized telescopes, and large-sized telescopes. So there, uh, and you see that each one of these telescopes are associated to a, a particular uh, re uh, region of the spectrum. So the small telescopes are important at the high energy region. The uh, medium-sized telescopes are, um, well, the large-sized telescopes are important at the low energy section. And then you have uh, the medium size, which will uh, make the bridge between these two energy, energy range. Um, and um, so, again, why, um, why is this, let me go back a little bit. It has a delay. Ah, here. Um, so here's the sensitivity curve for, um, uh, for CTA, for the Northern Observatory and the Sounder. And I, I mentioned that the peak sensitivity is somewhere uh, between one and 10 TV. Um, and, and then you, the, the sensitivity starts to degrade at high energy and also at low energy. So the sensitivity in this region here, the low energy region, will be defined basically by the large size telescopes. The sensitivity at the high energy will be defined basically by the small size telescopes. And in this region here, the medium size telescopes are the most important. Um, so the reason, be, the reason why um, the high energy region sensitivity is defined by the small size telescopes is, is because at high energies, the showers are big enough so they produce a lot of shrink of light at ground level so that you can put the small collectors, the telescopes with the small uh, telescopes and still collect a lot of photons. Then at low energies, photons are, um, showers are dimmer, so you will have less photons per square meter on the ground. So you need large um, mirrors to collect those photons. And then in, in the middle, you, you, you put something to make the bridge. Uh, but the message is, um, in this region where we want to have the best sensitivity, the medium-sized telescopes are the most important ones. So the medium-sized telescopes for CTAs are, are our uh, workhorses, so basically. Right, um, so this is the status of CTA. So there's, we already have a large size uh, telescope installed in the Canary Island, um, La Palma. Um, so uh, the camera is not being shown here. So the camera is somewhere here uh, and it has more than 1800 PMTs. It's a 1800, more than 1800 PMTs camera. Um, the diameter of the dish is 23 meters and this is the energy range uh, where it's going to have its um, um, best uh, sensitivity, okay? This is the low energy region for, for CTA. And uh, you can see that this huge telescope can reposition very fast with something, with a time of the order of 20 seconds, it can point anywhere in the sky. So this is gonna be important if CTA wants to um, uh, uh, follow transients, for example, huh? If the observatory receives an external alert, for example, a GRB or, or uh, any other merger and wants to reposition uh, to follow that source, uh, keep in mind that this could be done in less than a minute in CTA. Um, and uh, this first large size telescope is, is already uh, taking data. Uh, it already saw the crab. So the crab is kind of a, a standard candle um, in, in gamma ray astronomy. Uh, so Alicia probably uh, told that also, and Brian, 
uh, in, the, in the last week. Um, so the large size telescope um, was able to already see, the, see the, the crab. So here's the sky map of the crab. And so here's the photon count as a function of the angle with respect to the non position of the crab. So you can clearly see an axis here. Um, and more than that, you are not just seeing the supernova remnant, you are also, uh, this telescope was also able to, to see the, the emission from the poster inside the, inside the nebula. You see here the photon count uh, as a function of the, of, the, of the phase. So you can see um, the different pulses um, coming from the pulse. Um, the medium sized telescope, there's also a prototype um, um, that was constructed and this one is installed in, in Berlin, and it also started uh, seeing uh, its first showers. So you see that the, um, the uh, energy region where it's going to be most sensitive is, is, is this intermediate energy region here, and as I told you, these are CTA's workhorses, okay? Um, um, so there, there is, uh, in, in all these projects, there's a, there's a, a Brazilian participation in this case, uh, uh, Brazil was responsible for projecting and building the, um, um, the support structure um, for, the, for the camera, okay? Um, and we also have um, prototypes for the small size telescopes. So here's a, an example of the small size telescope. Um, and this is using a new technique, a dual, or this dual mirror design. Uh, which increases the field of view of the telescope. Um, and there's also a, a prototype installed in, 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 in Serra La Nave in, in Italy. Um, and also these small size telescopes um, pointed to the crab and they also saw an, an excess of events from the crab. Okay, so the science that we'll be, <coughs> that we're gonna be able to do with CTA is, is is very broad, it's, it's a broad range of, of, of topics. I just selected here a few topics um, um, that shows um, what uh, people will be doing with the data from CTA. So you, there's people, there's a whole dark matter program looking for uh, signals of dark matter annihilation in some astrophysical sources, uh, our galaxy for example, and, 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 and dwarf galaxies. Um, uh, but there's also people interested in galaxy clusters, X AGNs, as we are um, discussing in this um, in this talk, and um, and and there is an extra galactic survey. So I want to concentrate in this in this topic here. Um, this is one of the key science projects of, of CTA. So CTA is planning to spend a lot of time uh, scanning the extra galactic sky and in a very uniform way. Okay, there's a hand. I don't know, maybe dark matter is like concentrated in one country, how is? Well, the situation so far is, is, is that these groups are spread everywhere, okay? There's, there's people in, in Europe, there's people uh, in, in Latin America uh, looking for, well, already doing forecasts for the sensitivity of CTA to dark matter annihilation. So there's not a country, a particular country which is dominating the analysis so far, I can say. And there's people in Latin America, for example, in, in San Carlos, there's people working uh, hard on this dark matter um, um, program, for example. Mm -hmm. More questions? Yeah, I don't see. Okay. Um, but you can see that uh, uh, star forming regions will also be um, um, a topic that can be tackled with CTA data. Transients, as I just mentioned, for example, um, uh, nowadays with these multi messenger um, 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 techniques, um, if anything special uh, happens in the sky, uh, CTA will be able to receive an external trigger and, and look at that particular of the sky, and we'll also be able to send those triggers to other uh, detectors um, um, around the world. Um, there's a survey of the Large Magellanic Cloud, so here's a, 
for example, uh, a prediction of what uh, a CTA could see inside the large Magellan Magellanic cloud. There's a survey of the galactic plane, uh, a very um, um, uniform survey of the galactic plane. And then uh, there is this question about the pavatrons. The pavatrons are the general uh, denomination for sources able to accelerate um, uh, particles to the PV energy scale. There will be um, a special um, observation campaign of the galactic center and even fundamental physics. Uh, I, I put this item here and um, in terms of fundamental physics, for example, there's people interested in Lorentz invariant violation signals. Um, and what is the rationale behind this is that we are measuring these photons, these very high energy photons uh, with tens of GV to tens of TV energy propagating through uh, millions or billion light years um, until they reach Earth. Uh, and there are some um, uh, people that argue that um, the, uh, the structure of, of space-time uh, is not continuous at, at some energy scale. Uh, and in that case, you could have changes in the, um, uh, in the dispersion relation of photons as they propagate across the sky. So if you take energies uh, large enough and distance of propagation large enough, you could see in principle signs of these changes in the dispersion relation of photons uh, as they reach Earth. Um, so you could, uh, for example, induce time delays between photons of different energies that it could, in principle, probe um, uh, with, this, with CTA there, okay? But I'll concentrate on this extragalactic uh, survey here, which is uh, the most important for what we are uh, interested here, which is to recover uh, properties of, of, uh, of AGN. And so here, <coughs> are some forecast studies uh, that we did uh, having in mind the extra galactic survey of the of the um, of CTA. Um, so we started by using some uh, assumption by uh, making some assumption on the intrinsic spectrum of sources in this case simple power laws. We have distributed sources in redshift uh, following some luminosity some particular luminosity uh, distribution. Uh, the luminosity, the luminosity function that we assumed here was that one uh, that was fitted to the, um, to the first year of the Fermi data. And again, Fermi is sensible to GV emission, so we had to make some assumption on how the emission goes from the GV to the TV scale. So we basically extrapolated this power loss all the way from the GV to the TV energy scale. Uh, then um, we did the included all the absorption due to EBL. And at last, we injected those photons that reached the Earth into a simulation of the, of the CTA telescope and also simulated a very uniform um, a scan of the extragalactic sky, consistent with what, what is planned for, for CTA. Uh, we also, during the simulations, had to include cosmic ray backgrounds and, and also do uh, gamma hadron separation. And then at the end, we, um, uh, we selected sources that were clearly detected with a high statistical significance, a TS uh, greater than 25, uh, which would be equivalent to a five sigma detection. Um, so here's the um, telescope arrays that we used in these in this simulations. Um, you will see in the literature two kinds of telescope configuration for CTA. There is the so-called omega configuration, which is the ideal configuration. That's what we would really like to build in, in the future. It's a configuration with 118 telescopes. And there's the alpha configuration, the real configuration that we will start with. Um, so you see that there, it has less telescopes, um, essentially one half of the telescopes of the ideal configuration. And also the number of different telescopes uh, vary from one configuration to the other. So you can see, for example, let's take the real configuration for the Sandra hemisphere. It has 14 MSTs and 37 SSTs, uh, medium size and a small size. And if you look at the ideal configuration for the Sandra, you have four large size telescopes that are not present in the, in the real configuration. 25 MSTs 
and 70 SSDs, okay? Um, but the MSPs is a common property of the two configurations. They uh, come in, 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 less, in, in smaller numbers for the rear configuration, but they are still there. The same happens for the Northern Hemisphere where we have 15 MSTs in the Northern and nine MS MSTs um, for, the, for the rear configuration. Um, and um, four LS SSTs, four LSTs, and four LSTs here. So since the MSTs are the workhorses of CTA, they, they are in the, in the uh, ideal and in the real configuration, okay? Um, here are some um, um, representations of the telescope positions um, on, on, on the ground for the sounder hemisphere, for the full configuration, and for the alpha or initial configuration, okay? Um, again, this is the sensitivity curve. As I said, um, the MSTs will be very important to reach this peak sensitivity here um, for 50 hours of observation. And here's the area in the, the sky uh, that we plan to cover with this extra galactic survey. Uh, it's basically 25% of the, of the sky, okay, 25%. Um, the idea is to dedicate a total of 1,000 hours to scan this 25% of the sky, okay? Um, here is the region. Um, it's a little bit off the galactic plane. Uh, it starts with uh, five degrees in, in galactic latitude and in this uh, range of galactic longitude. This is one of the key science projects of CTA. And um, the idea is to break these 1,000 hours in approximately 400 hours for the sounder hemisphere and 600 hours for the northern hemisphere. That gives you, on average, for the northern, um, 2.21 hours per pointing, and in the sounder uh, hemisphere, a little bit below one hour per pointing. That's not much, uh, I would say, but of course you have to cover a very large area of the sky, so you cannot just stay forever in each which one of these points, right? You're, you're gonna have to compromise in, in a certain way, um, and, and that's what, it, which, what is uh, coming out um, of these um, planned survey. So here, you can see here the, the red dots um, are indicating the center of each observation region, so you observe for uh, this time um, at a given region, then moves to the next, you can see that there's going to be intersection so that you, you cover um, um, everything without holes. Uh, and of course you can, uh, it, it, this is a very uniform, even though sources will be observed more than once, you can easily correct for the observation, the differences in observation times um, between each pointing. Um, okay, so. Um, so after doing this a scan, you can, you can calculate what is the minimum flux that you're gonna be able to measure uh, with this um, survey. So this is represented here by, by this integral flux. So this is the flux above a certain energy threshold in units of, of, of millicrab. Uh, I told you that the crab is kind of a standard candle, so it's usual to represent these fluxes in, in units of crab. Um, and this was the target sensitivity of the key science project, and, and, the, and the points is what is coming out of our um, uh, simulation. So you can see here the minimum detected flux above a certain energy range as a function of the number of observations that a source is, um, uh, is actually observed. Eh? Since you're gonna have intersections between pointings, one source can be observed more than once. Uh, it can be observed once, twice, three times, four times, even, even five times. And you can see that each time you observe a source, uh, your uh, sensitivity improves. And at the end, uh, at least for the, for the alpha configuration, uh, for the south and for the north in blue and, and red, you approach the target sensitivity um, 
that was in the key science projects, okay? For the omega configuration, everything is okay. You're gonna be even below the target sensitivity um, after the source is observed a few times. Um, and here is the um, uh, expected number of detections for this exercise that we did. So you can then count after all this scan, you can count how many sources will be observed above five sigma. Uh, how many of them will be five sigma detection? And that's what is uh, shown here. Um, uh, this is the distribution of the, so we repeated this exer as exercise many times. So generated uh, synthetic samples by sampling from the luminosity function absorbing the photons in the extragalactic medium, injecting the photons in the simulation of the telescopes, and counting uh, how many sources are above five, five sigma. And here's the distribution of the five sigma detections for uh, the Northern uh, Observatory, for the Sounder Observatory, for the alpha configuration, the, the, the initial one or the real one, and the sum of the two, okay? So that gives about an average of 50 detection, 50 newly detected sources above five sigma. And if you look at the ideal configuration, that number would be around 52 new sources. Um, yeah, that doesn't uh, sound much, but again, you have to compromise. You have to uh, cover a large area of the sky and pointing um, on average, um, uh, one hour in each point for, for the north and 2.2 hours for the north. And that's what, uh, what comes out. We're still um, trying to improve this number. So this is preliminary, but we are working on that. Um, then you can also uh, try to predict how well CTA will uh, constrain the EBL. Uh, so here are some studies that were done inside CTA uh, by uh, selecting some sources that we know exist. So these are sources that uh, were already measured by other telescopes. Their redshift are none. Um, so you then place, do a simulation where you place the sources at their red measured redshift and also do this simulation um, uh, where you're gonna um, take the photons, include the absorption, and then injects into the simulation of the telescope. So this sample here used five sources uh, observed by 50 hours each one. So you see that the uh, observation time is much higher now. Um, then you have other sample in which you have 15 sources observed by 20 hours, and then a group of, of um, sources that were simulated in flare state. So these were 28 sources observed by uh, 10 hours. You can see typically what is the expected uh, flux that they will have at Earth and the histograms are the sensitivity, the expected sensitivity of CTA, okay? Uh, these uh, sources uh, also had a high detection sensitivity below five sigma, and you can see that they were simulated uh, also in different ways by putting different cutoffs at their, uh, at their end spectrum uh, according to their, to their classes, okay? And, um, yeah, so basically that's um, the final result. So here, what, what was done was to uh, see what would be the constraint on the global normalization of the optical depth of EBL as a function of the source redshift and uh, CTA are the blue um, rectangles here. And you can see, uh, that in comparison with other measurements, CTA will clearly be an improvement into the overall um, EBL uh, normalization. And just to finish, I would like to um, discuss um, another uh, point, which is you can even start thinking about constraining the Hubble constant uh, by doing these um, combined fits of absorption together with cosmological parameters because it turns out that H naught changed the absorption um, in the extragalactic medium. Here, for example, what we are plotting here is the energy of the cosmic gamma ray horizon. So at a given redshift, what is the typical energy at which absorption is, is important? And it turns out that if you vary the Hubble constant, you change the energy of the gamma ray horizon and you can then comp compare the energy of the uh, 
cosmic gamma ray horizon with respect to a standard energy uh, calculated for, uh, um, for a, a standard value of the uh, Hubble parameter. And you see that there's a change. There's clearly a change as you change H naught. And it turns out that the change are maximum in a, in a particular region of redshift. Uh, redshift is around 0 0.1, where you would see the change in, in, in the absorption due to uh, where you, you would most easily see a change in H naught, um, um, a change in absorption due to H naught. And as far as we understand, this effect is, is the result of two competing effects. First, as you change H naught, you change uh, the emissivity of starlight um, because you, you change, look back time, and you start changing the time that this, the star spends at each branch of the um, Her hertzsprung russell um, diagram. And it turns out that this is a positive correlation. If you change H naught, you increase, if you increase H naught, you increase a starlight emissivity. And there's a negative correlation with DTDZ. Um, but it, the net effect is this one that is, is, is shown here. So you can then make an exercise where you take a population of, of AGNs, distribute them in, in redshift, and measure the spectrum of these um, AGNs, and try to fit at the same time absorption parameters, like the fractions of the dust, and H naught at the same time. Uh, and you see that, oh, this, this was an exercise done with synthetic source, uh, of course, 12 AGNs placed exactly in that energy region, uh, in that uh, redshift range, so, sorry. So these uh, dotted lines here are typically, are the re marked redshift of the, of the 12 uh, AGN. And that's what you get. That's the kind of constraint that you get for, for H naught, something with a resolution around, I don't know, eight, nine percent in H naught. Um, of course, this is a, a very optimized um, situation in which we know exactly what is the uh, intrinsic pr uh, uh, spectrum of the, of the sources. They were all emitting, th these 12 sources were all emitting as power laws. We know that we have an intrinsic um, ignorance in the, in, the, in the intrinsic spectrum. So this will enter probably as a systematic effect on H naught. Uh, but in any case, um, um, you see that you have some, some um, sensitivity to H naught, okay? With 12 sources. And that's it. Thanks for your time. Okay. Uh, we are running actually 15 minutes late already, but uh, okay, time for one question there, and then we break for lunch. Uh, thank you for for the presentation. Very nice presentation. I was I have a question regarding the um, uh, absorption diagram as a function of redshift that you showed. Uh, uh, then there was a conclusion that uh, GV gamma rays were or no sorry, something like 100 GB gamma rays and below were not affected by, um, by these extragalactic photon fields. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my question is that um, uh, at the same time, you described uh, that um, the absorption through the extragalactic medium uh, produced pairs, right? These electron-positron pairs, mm, perhaps uh, very energetic, they could re-emit, right, by inverse Compton scattering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then this could contribute to lower energies to the SCD of any, I don't know, any source, a blazer, perhaps. No. So my question is that uh, if this diagram that you showed, I think it's the other one, that, that you have uh, a vertical line, sorry, an horizontal line, and then you have the different uh, curves. Uh, is that, that one, the, the previous one, this one. So below 100 GB, perhaps you would have the opposite effect, like an inverse absorption or a re-emission from the obscattered electrons. Mm -hmm. So my question is that, would it be, does it make sense to include this effect in that diagram? And would it be a, a significant contribution to constrain the extragalactic light? Right, that's a good question. So yeah, in principle, people study that, but in other contexts, because uh, 
in the context of um, trying to constrain the extragalactic magnetic field, right? Because these photons, they are propagating in the space, but we know that the extragalactic medium also has magnetic field. So the idea is that when a photon converts into an E plus E minus pair, in the presence of magnetic field, these uh, electrons and positrons will start to make a random walk in the extragalactic medium and do inverse Compton scattering. So what you expect is actually a point source emission and a halo around the source due to the plus and minus pair um, diffusing in the extragalactic medium. So depending on the range of, of uh, magnetic field intensities, you expect larger or smaller radius and uh, halos. And people are actually looking at that. And CTA has some sensitivity in order to study the extragalactic magnetic field due to diffusion of E plus E minus pairs uh, on the way. But you, you're right, there, 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 there must be a secondary flux due to inverse Compton, inverse Compton scattering um, of, these, of these photons. Uh, you, well, um, no, it's, it's not a bump. It's not a bump because uh, we don't, ex again, due to the presence of the, of the magnetic field, we don't expect that these two fluxes will superimpose at the same direction. You will have a point-like source, and then on top of a point-like source, a halo. But, but the effect is not a bump. It's basically an attenuation, an exponential attenuation. But we can discuss more later. Sorry, I, I miscalculated the time. I thought I had uh, <laughs> yeah. one and a half in total, one and a half hour in total. Sorry. <laughs>